<clears throat> Sorry. All right, we're live. Um, so we're picking up with Franz Fanon, uh, the <clears throat> Martinican philosopher, uh, philosopher, uh, psychoanalyst, and revolutionary. Uh, <clears throat> and um, we're reading the text on violence. Uh, so Fanon is um, thinking about colonialism, right? And specifically uh, decolonization. The overarching question of the text of Fanon's work in general <clears throat> is uh, what does decolonization look like? Uh, and yeah, right, how can it be achieved? So I was thinking, um, you know, it's, it's, Fanon is, is writing in this colonial context and uh, the colonial context is a global context. It's a global historical context. To think about decolonization uh, is to think about undoing a long historical progress uh, process uh, and to think about all of the factors that go in uh, to the creation of history. Uh, decolonization implies not just political overthrow uh, of the colonizing forces of the colonists. <clears throat> decolonization will also mean overturning uh, the system of values uh, and the society of the colonists the psychology of the colonists. <clears throat> so I was thinking about this, um, you know, in relation to the uh, Derek Chauvin, is that how you pronounce it, trial uh, that's happening right now in Minneapolis. <clears throat> Derek Chauvin, who was the police officer who killed George Floyd over the summer um, and thinking about you know, how we relate Fanon to, uh, to, you know, for example, um, the George Floyd murder, uh, the riots uh, and protests, um, I, I should say protests, um, although, you know, Fanon will give us reason to, to wonder if, if a protest is really better than a riot. <clears throat> Uh, you know, to what extent can we apply Fanon's thinking to our contemporary world? Right? Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, things are very much the same. Uh, Fanon, you know, born in Martinique, uh, when Martinique was a French colony, uh, but Today, Martinique is still a French colony. Uh, Fanon is, <clears throat> you know, the essay was written in 1961, published in 1963, um, you know, right before sort of um, the Civil Rights Act uh, in the United States um, and right before uh, Senegalese liberation in Africa. Uh, so, right, um, I think my, my point is Fanon is writing in a time of enormous upheaval. Um, and we also are living in a time of enormous upheaval, and many of the issues are still the same. Right? Martinique is still colonized. Uh, there's still, uh, you know, um, the 
uh, unwarranted killing of unarmed black men by police officers on a regular basis in the United States. Um, on a regular basis, meaning at a higher rate uh, than in, you know any other group. Um, so the upheaval of the 60s and early 70s um, appears very similar and is very similar in many ways uh, to the upheaval of our current age. Um, but it's also very particular, right? And um, it's important to remember the differences uh, and to think about the way that Fanon is, is inapplicable, right? Uh, responding to a very specific his, uh, period in history. Um, you know, Fanon, I think another, another thought I always have about Fanon um, is uh, he's difficult to, to place within a particular his, uh, philosophical strain of thought. Uh, and that is certainly by design, by his own design. Uh, I think one of the reasons that he's difficult to place in, uh, in history of philosophy up until Fanon, uh, and one of the ways that he avoids sort of being easily categorized that way is by being grounded in the specific history of his moment, uh, is by responding to the particularities of his world. Uh, he understands himself very much within a not a narrow, but a specific context. Um, so when we think about how Fanon is relevant to our moment, um, you know, we see a lot of commonality between the 60s and now. Um, you know, there's uh, racial tension, racial unrest, there's um, you know, uh, culture war in a much broader sense. Um, but a lot is very different also, right? Um, and, you know, I think to put a point on it, um, the application of Fanon or the way that we can think of Fanon in relation to I think the the issues that surround the Derek Chauvin trial, George Floyd mur murder, uh, and you know, Black Lives Matter movement, um, this whole movement, this whole upheaval, um, is if we think of racism in the United States as a part of uh, a much larger global historical force. Uh, Fanon is addressing the large global force. Uh, and in our analysis, I think we would want to, in order to use Fanon to address specific problems in the United States, we'd want to have an analysis of how racism in the United States uh, is part of this larger global racism. Um, Fanon's point, really, um, as sort of one of the foundational thinkers of, uh, of these questions, um, is Precisely that, right? That racism is historically conditioned. Uh, you know, and maybe I mentioned this in the last video, um, right? I think that often we, or one way of thinking about race and racism is 
you know, we, we hear this a lot in the United States, I think, uh, is that racism is a kind of natural default uh, attitude of human beings. Uh, that it's natural to be afraid of what is different from you. Uh, it's natural to be suspicious or cautious around um, the other. Right? Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the important contributions that Fanon makes to the way we think about race and racism is uh, to think about racism as a specific consequence of uh, particular historical events. And that's to say that the form of racism the form of race relations that we have in the world globally is a consequence of particular historical events uh, and historical dynamics. <clears throat> now, what this right, larger force is uh, or, or let's begin at the beginning. What the ultimate cause of all of this is, Fanon thinks, um, right, is colonization. Right? Now, colonization is on its own motivated by economic interest. Uh, European countries colonized uh, lands around the world out of economic interest, right? Whether it was, uh, as in the case of um, England, right, because there was land shortage, uh, because there um, was, <clears throat> uh, you know, food sh shortage in Ireland. Well, sorry, I'm getting confused here. Let's let's stick with the obvious ones. <laughs> um, Forgive me, my my history is um, is amateur, um, right? Spain goes to South America to find gold. Uh, Belgium goes to the Congo to get rubber. Um, England goes to India to get tea, right? A along with many other things. Uh, so colonization is initially motivated for economic reasons, right? out of economic interest, uh, to get wealth or to get land, which is the same as wealth. Uh, now, once that initial economic incentive is satisfied, right? once one has landed wherever one's going, uh, or rather, What allows that economic motivation to be followed through on and what grows as a result of the colonization that is you know, essentially economic is white supremacy. Right? Uh, and White supremacy is the ideology that justifies uh, colonization. Right. So when we're thinking about, when Fanon's thinking about how to decolonize, what decolonization will look like, he means not only the overthrow of the colonizing government, right? uh, France in Martinique and Algeria and uh, Vietnam, uh, many other places. Right? Um, he's thinking about more than just political overthrow. He's thinking also about overthrowing the broader ideology that justifies that. And in his analysis, 
what he's doing is he is <clears throat> uh, demonstrating the way that that ideology of white supremacy outlasts the political form of colonization uh, that it was initially wedded to. Um, all right, so white supremacy, right? This is a, a term we hear a lot. Um, in Fanon's world, and I think we'll stick primarily to that world, right? white supremacy refers to uh, the inherent moral superiority. Right? For Fanon, it is most, the most important element of uh, of white supremacist ideology, you know, um, is is this moral superiority, uh, and I um, made that noise because, right, this is sort of the difficulty of the term white supremacy, um, which is, you know, in interestingly, I think, becoming more narrowly defined, right, to, uh, to talk about um, white supremacist hate groups um, and and really specific sort of neo-Nazi groups. If non means something more more general, um, a, a prevailing ideology of right. We could use the other sort of um, very popular phrase um, these days, right? Which is white privilege. Um, and you know, I think we can think of white privilege and, and white supremacy as being, uh, you know, both parts of of the broader ideology that Fanon is really analyzing here, which is the ideology of the moral superiority of Europe, European peoples. Okay. So, <clears throat> Fanon begins by making a sort of strange claim, right on page one. Uh, well, he makes a few. Let's begin with the first sentence. Um, <clears throat> national liberation, national reawakening, restoration of the nation to the people or commonwealth, whatever the name used, whatever the latest expression, decolonization is always a violent event. Uh, so this, <laughs> this reminds me that the um, theme of our course is, um, is, is violence, right? Um, and Fanon is certainly a, the thinker that is most explicitly dealing with violence that we've read so far. Um, and what he's saying here right, is decolonization, the overcoming of uh, the world that is organized around the ideology of white superiority. Decolonization is always a violent event. Now, right, this is a good immediate moment to say, uh, right, what is decolonization? Um, what are the limits of decolonization? Fanon here is referring to national liberation, national reawakening, restoration of the nation, to the people or commonwealth. Uh, right? Obviously the immediate reference is to revolution uh, and revolution of the literally colonized countries um, against the colonizers. Uh, so in thinking about that question of how we apply Fanon to the United States, um, we have a different situation, right? Uh, one in which certainly, right, the racism is a consequence of the slavery and the slavery a consequence of, um, you know, a global cl a trade slave that is facilitated by colonialism. Uh, but, right, it is not colonized in the same way, right? We could, we could speak of, um, you know, the colonization of 
um, the Native Americans, uh, and that would be a more direct analogy, I think, uh, to what Fanon is, is talking about here um, in terms of Martinique and, and France. Right. So uh, again, um, you know, the, the specific dynamics are are different uh, and need to be analyzed differently. Which is not to, um, you know, which is not to say that uh, the world of colonization uh, and the, you know, the, the ideology of uh, white moral superiority is not fully at work in the United States, uh, and is not, you know, that this whole analysis of that worldview can't be applied. To the United States. <clears throat> but, the, but the point here is the necessity of violence or the inevitability of violence. Why is this decolonization, this confrontation with uh, both the political and social form of this ideology, violence. The violence here, I think, let, let me say this, I think question we should ask is whether or not the violence involved in decolonization is inevitable in the national revolutionary sense, uh, or if it's inevitable also in the uh, social and, um, and ideological sense. I think Fanon's answer will be yes. Uh, violence is inevitable between a clash of ideologies, especially a clash of, uh, well, violence is inevitable between a clash of ideologies uh, that are right, mutually defined in opposition to one another. This is the the point. It's not an opposition of ideologies. The ideology of the colonist and the ideology of the colonized. It's that the identity of the colonist and the identity of the colonized as colonist and colonized are defined in terms of one another and in an antagonistic relationship. And that that relationship can only be changed through the right, mutual annihilation of each identity. Colonists can no longer be colonists colonized can no longer be colonized in order for the colonized to no longer be colonized colonized they have to right uh, also destroy the colonist as colonist in other words you can't have a colonist without a colonized uh, and to eradicate all colonization all colonized people one also has to eradicate the colonist. Right? So that, yeah. So why, right? What is the substance of these identities? Right? Colonist and the colonized. This relationship of antagonism that is right, determined through colonization Fanon goes on. At whatever level we study it, 
individual encounters, a change of name for a sports club, the guest list at a cocktail party, members of a police force, or the board of directors of a state or private bank. Decolonization is quite simply the substitution of one species of mankind by another. What is colonization? It happens at the level of individual encounters, at the level of institutions and businesses, at social gatherings, uh, and then right at explicitly political institutions, uh, police forces, right, uh, offices of state, and right in economic centers, at boards of directors, at private banks. Decolonization is quite simply the substitution of one species of mankind by another. All right, so let me pause um, uh, at this question of the level of decolonization a little bit more. In every sector of society, colonization takes root. Uh, we think of this, you know, we could relate this uh, to gentrification, I think, right? Um, you know, at least perhaps only in terms of, not only, but at least in terms of the way the way power creeps in to uh, every level of society. I actually think gentrification is not the right analogy there. Forgive me. <clears throat> but what I, what I think the point I really want to make here is to point out that for Fanon, right, all of these parts of society are are in, infected, are infused with the ideology of white superiority. Right? And uh, that in order to decolonize them, one has to uh, fight that ideology in every part of society. Um, All right, I have to move on before I go down another tangent. Uh, so decolonization is quite simply the substitution of one species of mankind by another. What does he mean by this, right? This sounds, uh, this, this doesn't sound right, right? Um, what Fanon is getting at here is, you know, I think with dramatic language, although he repeats this, is to emphasize how fundamentally separate the world of the colonizer is from the world of the colonized uh, in a colony. Their worlds are separate in the first place, of course, materially. Right? The colonizer is rich. The colonizer lives in right, opulent houses. Uh, as he says toward the end of the essay. The colonized lives, uh, as he goes into in some detail, right, in poverty, in right, tiny houses, in, uh, in slums. Uh, that is to say, uh, if the colonized doesn't live on a plantation uh, and isn't enslaved. The world, the material world of the colonizer and colonized is radically different. But to say species here, to repeat it, implies a much more profound distinction uh, that is installed between colonizer and colonized. Right? It's not just a material difference uh, 
it is a moral difference, but even more than a moral difference, it is a transcendental difference. I think that's really the, the key. And, and you know, as I, I was emphasizing the moral difference, the moral superiority uh, that's claimed in this ideology, but that moral superiority uh, can only really be justified, can only really be understood through some claim to transcendence, right? to a transcendent superiority. Well, what makes one uh, culture, you know, objectively superior to another? Um, it must have some transcendent power. Um, so, um, <clears throat> I want to talk about Kant again in, in a little bit, uh, but I want to mention the relation between Fanon and Kant here also. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, this transcendence, right, that would justify superiority uh, is at the heart of, you know, German idealism, of uh, most modern European philosophy. Um, and so it's just, you know, I think it would be in keeping with Fanon's analysis of the world to say we have, we should, we must question uh, the extent to which even the most abstract moral philosophy like Kant's uh, is engaged in this much more elaborate, complex sort of global historical development, uh, which is indeed, on, on the one hand, ideal uh, as the development of you know, the history of thought, but on the other hand, material, right? Uh, and we can think of Marx here as the, the development of historical uh, materiality um, through the accumulation of capital, et cetera. Uh, and I think we also have to think about Hegel and the combination of those two. Right? Uh, that the entire world, that material, uh, ideal, and um, whatever Hegel is, is part of the process of colonization, right? Which is not to say that that thinking and that philosophy needs to be rejected uh, out of hand, right? That there is no value in it. Um, or, 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 anyway, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Fanon's argument uh, is, right, and, and I'm agreeing with Fanon on this, not that my opinion matters, that all modern philosophy is, should be understood in the context of colonization. From my perspective, that is correct. But that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't valuable, that it's not valuable to read that philosophy. Uh, I didn't, um, you know, we didn't read all that philosophy just to, just to learn <clears throat> halfway through that it was useless. Uh, if I thought that I wouldn't have done it. Um, So anyway, I think this gets into, again, um, the particularity of the situation uh, and, you know, how do we parse um, the way that ideology is infused in our daily world and how do we recognize that part of our life and being that remains independent of that ideology.
anyway, long detour, excuse me, to continue talking about this idea of species, right? Uh, that all this philosophy, you know, the transcendentality of reason, of rationality, uh, is put to service uh, if it isn't conceived in the service of. It's anyway put to service in the colonial project, the project of colonization, by justifying right, this ideology of white moral superiority, of white superiority in general. Uh, and so with that, one can justify one superiority. However, this justification has no content, right? That is to say, it doesn't claim that any particular value is superior to any other particular value. Instead, it says a group of people and a culture is superior to another. And whatever values that culture has are superior values to the values of the other culture. So the separation becomes uh, right, profoundly moral in this sense. The transcendence, the inherent superiority, uh, justifies whatever value, whatever values, whatever, you know, cultural values, whatever actions essentially are taken by uh, members of that group, qua members of that group, right, as members of that group. Uh, and, right, it will say whatever values the other group, the inferior group had, are bad, are evil. Fanon at one point refers to this as uh, Manichaean duality. Right? And, um, that's on page six. Uh, this Manichaean duality is between good and evil, the superior and the inferior. Um, and all of this, we must remember, right, is facilitating economic interest, the economic interest of colonization. However, once that ideology is installed, and why, why is this ideology needed? Right? Well, uh, obviously, to justify the extreme violence of colonization itself. Right? When Fanon says, decolonization is inevitably violent or is always violent. Uh, you know, another way to think about that would be um, that's because everything that is determined within the realm of colonization uh, has a foundational violence in it. Right? Uh, to decolonize is violence in self-defense against right, a continual aggressor who is continually doing violence through colonization. Uh, so the violence is inevitable in decolonization because of the uh, inherent violence of colonization in the first place. Now, in decolonizing them, what happens is 
in theory, right? Both colonist and colonized uh, are released from the sphere of colonization, right? from the original violence of colonization. Now, in order for that to happen, well, let me pause. Because what do we mean by colonist here? We mean, uh, Fanon means, again, kind of double um, sense. There are the active political agents of colonialism that are you know, occupying Martinique, Algeria, um, where Fanon was a freedom fighter. Uh, and then there are the more passive beneficiaries of colonialism, of the active colonists. Right, the Europeans, the ones who are still there uh, in Europe, not living in the colonies, but benefiting from the wealth that comes back from the colonies. Um, as Fanon says in one point, right, uh, the opulence, I think actually when he uses the word opulence in this, it's in this context, he says, the opulence of Europe um, is was created by uh, the colonies. Right? The, the enormous wealth of um, 18th, 19th, 20th century Europe, and uh, yeah, uh, is the product of colonization. Right? Comes from the colonies. Uh, you know, England is a tiny island. Uh, it had basically no resources. Uh, after colonization, it uh, was and remains one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Right? Um, where does that wealth come from? And it's generated from the colonies. That's why they wanted the colonies. Um, you know, the same is true of many other European countries. Right? It's often said, uh, you know, one of the sort of um, common places that's said about, about Africa, right, is, uh, and you know, this is certainly a product of that ideology of, of white superiority. To, to say this, um, is Africa is a poor nation, uh, right? And this is a, a point that's been made by, by many scholars. Um, Africa is not a poor nation, right? Africa is incredibly uh, rich in resources. Um, Africa is an extremely wealthy country, uh, continent, um, you know, uh, region. Um, and African countries are individually extremely wealthy in resources uh, and in labor power, right? in, in the things that you need to have a wealthy economy. The reason why African countries are, are poor is because all the wealth is extracted. It was extracted during colonialism, and as Fanon gets into toward the end of the essay, right, it continues to be extracted through you know, multinational corporations, um, which, as Fanon very you know, insightfully for 1961, recognizes uh, the multinational corporations uh, will move in after um, the initial, the political uh, decolonization of these, of these colonies. So, different species, different worlds, uh, they occupy right, different moral um, categories and you know, I'm struggling to articulate, um, but I think you know, the, the force of this word species is so strong. Um, it is, uh, we cut this reading from the syllabus, unfortunately, but it, it's, um, I think if, one word to place Fanon alongside uh, another philosopher. It might not be um, Jean-Paul Sartre, who he's often associated with, but instead Emmanuel Levinas. Because this idea of different species refers to uh, 
uh, the absolute otherness of the other, uh, which is a, a Levinasian articulation, that the other becomes completely foreign, right? The colonist to the colonized, colonized to the colonist. Uh, it, it's more than, um, than an opposition. I mean, it, it, it is. It's absolutely a fundamental binary opposition. It's more than a, than a difference. It's more than, um, you know, one species alongside another. Uh, they are like mortal enemies. Um, but more. <laughs> uh, their worlds are fundamentally heterogeneous. That's the word I'm looking for. Excuse me. Right? Heterogeneous and incommensurable. The world of the colonized. Two things. First, there is fundamental difference and opposition between colonist and colonized within the realm of colonization. And then there is the fundamental uh, heterogeneity between European thought, political forms, and ideology, and the native uh, way of being, way of thinking, way of living that existed prior to decolonization. Colonization brings these fundamental, fundamentally other cultures into a relationship. Now, uh, fundamentally other cultures, you know, um, not in a transcendental way, in a historical way. Uh, fundamentally other in the sense of having evolved to have right, systems of values that are um, essentially unrelated to one another. Uh, you know, we can certainly talk about um, the interconnectedness of the world right, and say um, there are trade routes and supply chains that probably ran from Senegal, uh, from Congo to, uh, you know, Spain, um, and that there was commerce, you know, going much further back and to a much greater extent than, um, you know, archeologists have been able to prove, um, right. The world is all very much more in interconnected, um, than we maybe think. And we can still say, right, that there are essentially different cultures, uh, that have like historically developed to, interpret being, interpret the world in unique uh, and, and incommensurable, but equally valid ways, right? And so one of the questions is um, of decolonization, one of the major questions of decolonization for Fanon is having been brought into the sphere of colonization, um, how do we get out? Does it mean returning to pre-colonial of being? Does it mean uh, right, assimilating? to merely become like the colonists. If um, we might imagine, for example, to eliminate the category of colonized people, everyone could become a colonist, uh, not politically speaking, but culturally. Right? Everyone becomes European. Uh, or To decolonize, is it necessary to create 
uh, a new concept of being, a new concept of, of human being. Right? And this is really uh, the most important, or, or Fanon's answer will be the third, right? to create a new concept of, of man, of human being. On page two, and he writes, You know, I, I, yeah. On page two, he writes, <clears throat> decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is clearly an agenda for total disorder. Right? We can't go back to the old ways. We have been colonized. We have colonized. Whether you're the colonist or the colonized, there's no going back. Decolonization will mean the dissolution of the culture that colonized and that justified that colonization and culture that was colonized. Right? The culture that was colonized was already dissolved uh, through colonization. Uh, it can be incorporated into the new world, Fanon thinks, uh, but it can't be regained entirely. So what we have, then, what is required to get out of decolonization is a kind of total anarchy, anarchy in the sense of disorder. Uh, total disorder, dissolution of all ideologies. So, he says, decolonization never goes unnoticed, dot, dot, dot. It infuses a new rhythm specific to a new generation of men with a new language and a new humanity. Decolonization is truly the creation of new men. Right? But such a creation cannot be attributed to a supernatural power. The thing colonized becomes a man the very process of liberation. Decolonization requires the creation of new men, new people. This doesn't mean, right? well, first of all, let's just put this in the context of this word species. Right? And the way that Fanon thinks about, uh, about people. Right? It's kind of Nietzschean idea, almost. Right? Um, that what it means to be a person is a shifting idea. What it meant to be a human in Rome or in 19th century France, what it means to be a human in Right, uh, um, the Qin Dynasty, China, uh, or uh, you know, in pre-Columbian Martinique, are all fundamentally different ideas. Or right, uh, there will be really different values associated with what it means to be human, uh, and life will be very different. The meaning of being the thing that we are is historically and culturally determined. And therefore, right, 
on the one hand, there can be no inherently superior culture. But the main point here, I think the, the important point is, so from out of this disorder, new people, a new kind of human, a new kind of man. Uh, but this creation is not self-generated or not in the sense, not ideally generated, not generated through decision about what we will be. We don't decide what a good person looks like and then, or, or a good person, a new person, what this, this decolonized subject will look like. We can't say, ah, if I, um, you know, just behave this way or do X, Y, and Z, uh, I will become decolonized, right? As if, right, the colonist and the colonized could uh, change their habits, right, to put it in Aristotle's terms, and become decolonized. Can't happen simply at the level of daily interaction, at the individual level. That's, that's what I mean to say. It can't happen at the individual level. I'm just wondering to what extent an individual can decolonize themselves. I think, I think not. I think an individual, per Fanon, cannot decolonize themselves. That's the point. The way to create these new men, this new species, is through liberation. It is by overthrowing the colonists by breaking the system of colonization and the ideology of white superiority that facilitates it. Uh, it is in that act that the new kind of man will be born. Uh, we can't decide what that will look like, what it will mean to be a decolonized subject. We'll know it once we are it. Like the only way to become decolonized is to decolonize. And that, uh, Fanon thinks, requires violence. So let me say a little bit more about this world. I'm trying to <clears throat> think about um, the necessity of violence here. And I think I've already addressed that um, sort of unfortunately, um, but we'll come back to it. Because I mentioned this in the last video, I want to mention another section here. And I know we're working through this very slowly. Um, Fanon is a Marxist. Uh, and I've already mentioned that he's grounded in his particular material circumstances. Uh, and, you know, as I was just saying, um, the individual can't decolonize. Uh, decolonization 
is a global project uh, because colonization is a global project. And the way that one begins the process of decolonization is through violent revolution, right? Again, this is the specificity of Fanon's time. Uh, the, right, Algerian independence um, came the year after Fanon wrote this. Uh, so <clears throat> he was actively engaged in a armed revolution against, uh, against France, against the, the colonists. Um, and that armed revolution is only possible through collective action. And Fanon sees that there is a huge and important parallel between Marx's idea of uh, overthrowing capitalism and Fanon's idea of right, decolonization. After all, colonization is a project of capitalism, right? And therefore, uh, decolonization is a project of communism, right? um, or we might think. That's not what Fanon thinks. <laughs> Rather, decolonization is a project of dismantling capitalism. And an essential part of decolonization will be in redistributing wealth. Let's see where he says this. What matters today, he says on page 55, the issue which blocks the horizon is the need for redistribution of wealth. Humanity will have to address this question, no matter how devastating the consequences may be. So it is a question of dismantling capitalism. It is a question of redistributing wealth, of rearranging the political economy. But it's not simply a question of dismantling capitalism. Capitalism is not uh, the only force of colonization, right? The other force of colonization is this uh, ideology of white moral superiority. Uh, and so he writes on page five. Looking at the immediacies of the colonial context, it is clear that what divides the world is first and foremost what species, what race one belongs to. In the colonies, the economic infrastructure is also a superstructure. Right? In the colonies, the economic infrastructure is also a superstructure. The cause is effect. You are rich because you are white. You are white because you are rich. This is why a Marxist analysis should always be slightly stretched when it comes to addressing the colonial issue. It is not just the concept of the pre-capitalist society so effectively studied by Marx, which needs to be re-examined here. The serf is essentially different from the knight, but a reference to divine right is needed to justify this difference in status. In the colonies, the foreigner imposed himself using his cannons and machines, despite the success of his pacification. In spite of his appropriation, the colonist always remains a foreigner. It's not the factories, the estates, or the bank account, or the bank account, which primarily characterize the ruling class. The ruling species is first and foremost the outsider from elsewhere, 
different from the indigenous population, the others. So that with colonization and thus uh, with race relations, right, the questions of race, <clears throat> it's not merely about factories, estates, and bank accounts. Uh, because the force that ultimately justifies the domination of colonization is not uh, the instruments of the economy, the banks, uh, or uh, the technology, right? Although the banks and the, you know, weapons technology uh, certainly help, right? And we have to take in that into account, right? What are the specific material historical conditions that led to uh, the development of those weapons and, and all, all of that? Uh, you know, the other primary force here, right, is that the ruling class is determined to be rulers, not because of wealth or technological power, but simply because of foreignness. Right? Um, and yeah. So this is why a Marxist analysis needs to be extended. And the way to extend it, or um, what he'll say, let's see if I can find this. Going back to page 55. <clears throat> the way to extend this is to imagine a future, right, a decolonized world that is uh, that is not Eurocentric, right? Um, because Marx and socialism and the fight between socialism and capitalism uh, are part also of this you know, you know, modern Europe, the history of modern Europe, they are part of colonization, part of the whole system, right? Marx's analysis is right. Capitalism is exploitation, according to Fanat, right? And it, that, that is uh, more clear than ever in the colonies. Right? Uh, but it doesn't mean that the solution is necessarily communism. Communism is uh, its own kind of antipode, its own kind of antithesis to capitalism liberalism. Uh, and so it's bound up in the same network. True decolonization, Anand suggests, would mean embracing right, the critique of capitalism and the you know, ideas of solidarity, uh, collective action against uh, the ruling class. Right? All that is, is you know, works as an analogy. But the consequence uh, is, for Fanon, needs to be more creative, broader, right? Not caught up uh, in the series of consequences that is the colonial period. He goes on, on page 55. It was commonly thought that, it, <clears throat> that the time had come for the world and particularly for the third world, to choose between the capitalist system and the socialist system. The underdeveloped countries, which made use of the savage competition between the two systems in order to win their national liberation, must, however, refuse to get involved in such rivalry. All right, so what he's referring to here, and this is, you know, I would have liked to have talked about this more, maybe we can get into it later. 
Um, you know, this is all so deeply rooted in the history of this time. He's talking about African countries uh, that are, you know, fighting colonial powers, um, but they're doing it uh, either, you know, under the banner of liberalism or under the banner of, of communism. And they're doing that um, for, you know, a number of reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, at least one of them is that, you know, if you are a, a rebel group um, that is communist, then you would get uh, support from the Soviet Union, right? And if you're a rebel group that is capitalist or liberal, then you get help from the United States. This is the Cold War. Um, and so, you know, these liberation armies and this effort for liberation is fighting this, this uh, you know, colonization. But uh, it also has to vie with these competing Cold War uh, interests that are trying to influence and, and corrupt uh, the new government, right? The new man. Um, you know, the Soviets and the Americans want to determine what uh, the new decolonized person will be. Um, and if not saying, right, no, we, we uh, can use these forces in order to overcome colonization. If the Soviets want to help us overthrow, uh, you know, um, our government, then then that's great. Um, but once that government is overthrown, once we have liberated ourselves, once we're in control of our own government, uh, then we have to tell the Soviets that um, you know we won't do what they say. And obviously, the same is true of the United States. Um, now. That is not what happened, right? And Fanon is, is um, warning against this and talks about this at a little, some length. Um, right? That very often when uh, there is you know, the overthrow of a colonial power, uh, the new government uh, gets a huge influx of cash from some global power, very often the United States, and becomes a kind of client state of the United States, right? That does the United States bidding, follows the economic interests of the United States. Um, you know, we see this still happening. Uh, this just happened, this is ongoing in Bolivia, in fact, right? Um, uh, where the, uh, you know, extremely popular um, and long serving president, Evo Morales, um, was overthrown by a government-backed, military-backed, sorry, a, a military coup that was backed by the U.S. government and other, um, you know, liberal uh, Western powers. Right? Eva Morales uh, is an, an indigenous Bolivian uh, and a, a communist uh, or a socialist in any case, right? He was one of Hugo Chavez's closest allies. Um, so, you know, we still see in these former colonies, right? Bolivia obviously was uh, a former Spanish colony. It was um, liberated, you know, first by, uh, I believe, Simon Bolivar in the 19th century. Um, and, uh, but, right, the, 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 Bolivia is actually a really interesting case um, because Evo Morales is the first indigenous president of Bolivia. Um, and, <clears throat> So it really represents, uh, you know, a, a indigenous uh, indigenous power running a former colonial state, uh, and is doing it as a socialist, and, um, influenced from Hugo Chavez, perhaps whatever, um, right? And this military coup uh, overthrew him, right? Follow the U.S. Mil uh, media, right? Follow the U.S. news on this story, right? Everything that they say is, uh, even Morales, you know, is um, unpopular, you know, bad, bad guy. This new government is going to be good. They, they, they've obviously taken sides. Um, they're putting their fingers on the scales. There was recently a uh, second election in Bolivia, and Evo Morales uh, won handily. And his old socialist government is back in power. Um, obviously, he is genuinely popular right? uh, and represents 
real ownership of state power by formerly colonized people. Um, and these large uh, you know, global powers like the United States are still trying to put their finger on the scale, trying to meddle in the self-determination and self-governance of formerly colonized states. Um, and why, right? Because even Morales is a socialist, uh, because they have uh, economic interests in Bolivia. And if there's a socialist government, then they get you know, less of a return on their uh, their projects in, in Bolivia uh, and, and elsewhere. Right? So there's an economic interest, again, uh, in the United States uh, and, and, you know, China also, um, lots of other global powers. China is doing this in a major way, in fact, with the Belt and Road Project, um, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so it's, you know, it is um, a continuation of that same colonial dynamic, right, where uh, the native people is seeking liberation and seeking decolonization and, and that creation of a new a new way of being. Um, but right, that, that effort is continuing, uh, continuing to be thwarted or, or attempted to be thwarted by uh, these large global powers that are continuing to pursue their former colonial interests through uh, international economic bodies like uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, um, uh, things like that, right? Uh, not to mention, right, the, the influence of uh, international corporations, uh, multilateral corporations, which have outsized influence over, um, over the U.S. government and, and, you know, most governments around the world, you know, many governments around the world, certainly in the U.S. So decolonization. Right. creation of a new kind of person that uh, is going to break out of this historical force of colonization. Uh, so just to wrap up, and we'll talk about this next week, right? this is, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting to relate this to um, our current situation. Sorry, I'm computering out here. It's three in the morning. Um, all right, so I will see you on Monday.